the second in our series, Pathways to Success, Helping Students with College and Career Decisions. The second webinar is titled Females in STEM Classes and Programs of Study, Teachers' Strategies to Recruit and Transition Female Students into STEM Careers, presented by Courtney Reed Jenkins. My name is Greg Nagy, and I am the Virtual Learning Community Manager from The Ohio State University, who provides technical support for the STEM Equity Pipeline project. Before we start the presentation, I would like to go over some housekeeping items for this webinar. This webinar is scheduled to last roughly one hour and is being recorded in order to view this presentation in its entirety later. The recorded webinar will be available in the next few days on the stemequitypipeline.org website. As you've already found out, you'll be watching the presenter present slides through the Adobe Connect interface while listening to them talk over your computer speakers. All the participants' microphones have been automatically muted. You can also download the slides and other files from the Files pod at the bottom of the Adobe Connect window. Click on the file you want to download, and then click on the Save to My Computer button. This will open the file as a link in a different tab in your browser. The presenter will answer questions after the presentation. However, we can take questions at any time. This is how we're going to take questions. At any time during the presentation, you may submit a question by typing your question in the chat pod at the bottom of the Adobe Connect window. We will read and respond to these questions at the end of the presentation. I would like to start the webinar by introducing Courtney Reed Jenkins, Director of Professional Development. Courtney? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second in the five-part webinar series. I am pleased to present today's webinar, which is entitled Females in STEM Classes and Programs of Study, Teacher Strategies to Recruit and Transition Female Students into STEM Careers. Support for this webinar series came from the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities and the Minnesota Department of Education. They funded these webinars specifically to provide information to all of us who have a role in helping students understand successful paths to high skills, high wage, and high demand jobs. On their behalf, I welcome you. And additional funding is through the National Science Foundation provided to NAEP, the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity, for the STEM Equity Pipeline Project 2.0. And the archived webinar is available on the NAEP website and also on the MinSKU website. We, one of the differences between the, this webinar and the last webinar is we are providing certificates of completion and please request a certificate either from uh, at the end of the evaluation. And if you're from Minnesota, that will come from the Minnesota Department of Education. And if you're not from Minnesota, it will come through the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity. I do want to give everyone a reminder. We always have a little bit of uh, juggling when we offer a webinar across the country in terms of time zones. So I wanted to remind folks that we will host the remainder of this webinar series and the times are at 11 Eastern, noon Central, one Mountain Time and two Pacific Time. And we will send an, a reminder out for the February 5th, March 12th and April 9th webinars with those times as a reminder to all of us. As we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about myself and some of the reasons I do this work. I don't know all of you, but I am the Director of Professional Development for NAEP. I have worked for the Wisconsin State Educational Agency for 13 years, doing a variety of civil rights and education work from in career and technical education, focusing on sex equity and the civil rights requirements through the federal legislation that funds career and technical education. I've worked in special education on the compliance side of special education. And I have also focused specifically on racial equity in special education for the last five years at the Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin. I was raised in a socially active family. I'm a granddaughter of a coal miner in Western Pennsylvania, who helped unionize the mines. And I'm a granddaughter of the first woman to serve on the school board in Butler, Pennsylvania. And my parents continued that work as my dad is a minister who brings social justice to the least privileged in his community. And 
my mother who gave me my first memory of race, which is a question that Glenn Singleton often poses. So if you've worked with Glenn Singleton in Courageous Conversations about race, his work has informed much of my practice. And I wanted to share with you a couple of the things that I've been thinking about most recently. So I finished a book by Sandra Hansen called Swimming Against the Tide, African American Girls and Science Education, and look to that book for some really good, thoughtful thinking around the intersection of gender and race, particularly for those of us in STEM. And I also finished a book that is called Talking the Walk, which is a communications guide for racial justice. So those are some things that are informing the work that I'm doing most recently. I like to start all of my presentations with a uh, little bit of time focused on something that's in the news and whether it is honoring those that have come before us or someone who's a bright and shining star. I like to highlight that and pick it apart a little bit from the research perspective. So this is Deepika Karup. She's a 14-year-old high school student and she was in India and watching some children drinking from a stagnant pond there and knew that that was not the healthy way to get, the healthiest way to get water. And so she decided to find a solution to the global water crisis, which is her words. And she actually made some progress towards that goal and developed a sol solar powered water purification system. And she just won the Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge because it is a low cost invention that can be scaled up and broadly replicated. The, this was her second time in entering and I'm sharing her story and hope that those of you who work with middle school students consider sharing her story because in Deepika's example, there's some incredibly strong principles of research related to our topic today, which is non-traditional recruitment and retention. And the first is that the focus of Deepika's work is to find a solution to the global water crisis. And the National Academies for Engineering in 2008 summarized a, an extraordinary body of research that we'll look to in a little bit around messaging for STEM. And they found that the four messages that resonated most strongly with girls in particular, were that engineers, although we can expand this to STEM, make a world of difference. Engineers are creative problem solvers. Engineers help shape the future. And engineers, or STEM, is essential to our health, happiness, and safety. So when we look at Deepika's story, we can see those messages clearly resonating in um, her story. The second body of research that we see in her story is that Deepika is persisting with a growth mindset. So she didn't magically win the contest. She didn't win the contest the first time she entered. Instead, she learned from her experiences and returned to the contest with a stronger, more solid understanding of science and the process of the competition. And cultivating that growth mindset is a key strategy for STEM teachers at the middle school, high school, and post-secondary levels when we want female students in particular to persevere in science. Today, there are two primary goals. The first is to build your content expertise regarding gender equity in STEM. And we're gonna do that because we only have an hour by looking at two specific areas. First, focusing on the bridge between middle school and high school and high school and post-secondary. So looking at those transitions as weak points and places to seal up with an extra layer of duct tape. And secondly, to understand the research related to the recruitment and retention of girls in STEM. And then we also have a goal for today to grow you as an equity champion and leader within your sphere of influence. And that in specific will ask you to identify and think about how to implement at least three research-based strategies in your classroom or share with colleagues if that's 
the more appropriate way for you to share the information. Today, I'm going to share with you strategies that are fast, cheap, and in your control. There is no one silver bullet. If there were, we would uh, all be out of a job. But there are many strategies that work, and it's a matter of finding a strategy that you want to implement that's aligned with the particular needs of your community and where you're seeing responses. So today we'll go through and specifically talk about 27 examples and strategies that you may want to consider. And the point of these strategies are that they're fast, meaning that they'll take minutes to implement to several days, but these are not strategies that require significant amounts of planning or preparation. They strateg all of the strategies that I'll share are free or with minimal costs attached. And all of the strategies can be implemented by you in your classroom or office. So really focusing on what do you have within your sphere of control that you could look at with a little bit more critical eye and revise to see if it changes in terms of creating a more robust pipeline of female students in education and careers. I want to leave you with the clear understanding that we all don't have to wait for the grant from the National Science Foundation. Um, we don't have to wait for the business and industry partnership, but that we do have control over our classrooms and offices, and that can make a huge difference in the lives of students, particularly female students that you serve. We have secondary and post-secondary faculty, staff, and administrators on the phone, which is one of the strengths of our webinar series. We have a really robust group of people that are interested and committed to issues of equity in education. And so as we move through the slides today, I'll be sharing examples that are more relevant to other folks in the audience than perhaps you. And I ask that if you can think of someone to pass it along to, that would be a great way of extending the knowledge and expertise. I based the title of this of our work today, Fast, Cheap, and In Your Control, on the uh, movie by Errol Morris in 1997 that's called Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. And I did it because it was catchy and it worked, but then when I pulled this poster up and started to look at this poster, I realized it was a perfect jumping off point for our discussion today. So if we use our equity lens, we See who is on the poster and profiled in the movie and who is not. So we have four men who look to be white. We don't see physical disabilities. We don't know if there are other disabilities. But we know for sure that it doesn't reflect our country and it certainly doesn't reflect the diverse and robust group of people we want to invite into STEM and encourage in STEM. And so as I looked at this poster, I thought this is a perfect place to pause and encourage you to think about and reflect on the images on your walls, in your halls, in your curriculum. Does it reflect your community? Does it reflect the students you want to attract into your classes and programs? And to think about some resources that might do it a little bit differently. So even if there are images of really interesting innovation, uh, inventions or machines or tools or technologies, does it also include images of people and in particular images of female students, students of color, students with disabilities that would add to the diversity of your classroom? So one of the tools that's useful for people to do an environmental scan of their curriculum and of their classroom was developed by the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity, and it's on our STEM Equity Pipeline webpage. So if you look at your Adobe Connect room, you see the webinar on the upper left and the survey web links on the lower right. You can click on the stemequitypipeline.org and click on Browse To, and it will take you to the page. So you can bookmark that as a resource. and. On the scan, as part of the scan, I'll give you a sampling of some of the questions that you might find on the scan. Things like for teachers, list the resources in your classroom or office that give information about non traditional occupations, particularly girls or women in STEM. 
Curriculum or textbook reviews include examining the illustrations and how are men and women depicted in them? Are men often depicted in traditionally masculine roles or predominantly in active roles? And then for counselors and, and um, advisors, some of the questions in the environmental scan are things like, describe any activities you take to encourage students to pursue careers in fields where the majority of workers are of the opposite sex. Describe when and in what context you discuss salaries with students, and if you're just as likely to discuss these with males and females. For everyone, listing the names and titles of, non, of women in STEM that have served as teaching, presenting, or mentoring in, at, your web, at your site, and listing staff development opportunities around increasing the number of females in STEM in your school, program, or college. Again, all of those questions and more are on the environmental scan that are on the STEM website. So let's turn specifically to strategies that help bridge between middle school and high school. So one of the, this is one of the first places we need to pay attention because we know that it is a source of significant leakage. If you look at your local data, my guess is it's similar to most places around the country where we've worked, where students are taking um, either required to take an elective that all students take a tech ed or pre-engineering class in middle school, and then once they hit high school and, and consider those elective courses, the numbers are dramatically different. And we also need to pay attention to this transition point because many of the course sequences and successful STEM pathways are determined by the STEM choices students make in eighth and ninth grade. So, most STEM pathways result in capstone courses, so students who don't take STEM electives as ninth graders miss their opportunity for some of the most significant benefits, for example, AP course credit for STEM classes, college credit for Project Lead the Way capstone courses, dual enrollment at community and tech colleges, secondary, post-secondary alignment. So, I want to share with you three specific examples that seal up that pipeline leak between middle school and high school. And they're based on current work that the National Alliance for Partnerships in Equity is doing in Illinois and California. The first is that if the eighth graders have class selection fairs or events at the middle school, so introducing the middle school students to what courses they can select or take at the high school, Many times this happens at a fair or an event at the middle school. Ask a, a one or two high school students who are female and successful in STEM to come with you to talk about their experience in STEM classes. Another way that the schools are, are attracting middle school students into high school courses that are STEM related are to do things like have a drawing so middle school girls at the fair sign up or fill in for a drawing for an iPod, for example, um, that would give you the names of students to contact after the fair is over. Another way that the, some schools are recruiting students from middle school to high school are specific and personalized letters of invitation to courses or programs at the high school level. So it's contacting the middle school teachers and asking who's doing well in science, math, or if there's a pre-engineering or tech ed course, and that is female, that, who is female that they think would do well in high school, and sending a personalized letter to those students and their families. It specifically, the letter specifically needs to include, we're contacting you because you have a strong ability in science, technology, engineering, or math, and we know that people, that students with that ability will do well in this course, and here's some more information about our course, a personalized invitation or contact. And the third strategy to seal up the pipeline between middle school and high school is to focus on marketing or highlight the programs 
through whatever means the middle schools are using. So if they have a daily channel one, if they have announcements over the loudspeaker, if you can show video in the counselor's office or as part of the career fair, and use video that the high school students take of themselves, and in particular of females in STEM has been successful at U46 in Elgin, Illinois. The next strategy, recruitment strategy, is to focus on that bridge between high school and post-secondary. So how do we feel the leap between high school and post-secondary? When female students, so female students participate at or above the participation rate of male students in academic STEM courses in high school, but they don't go on to post-secondary STEM courses. In career and technical education, it's a little bit different. The participation rates in STEM are lower for female students, both at high school and post-secondary. So it takes an extra step to seal that transition. But when we do have the students prepared for STEM at post-secondary, but that don't choose to go into it, there are some specific recruitment strategies that can be in place. For example, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is has a nonprofit organization that is for women of TI and then it transitioned to high tech high heels and they offer physics camps for high school students to prepare them for physics either at the high school level or at the college level but really providing that support for them as they make upper level course decisions around science, technology, engineering, and math. At Iowa Western, what they noticed when they disaggregated their data and analyzed their data was that they had a 50% of the students in the IT program at the theater high schools were female students, and they were not transitioning to the community college. Instead, the community college participation rate of female students was between 10 and 13%. So their strategy was to target students who would be successful in IT at the community college level, so target those female students in IT at the, at the high school level, and provide for them monthly get-togethers where the students were able to connect with other female high school students who were interested in IT and then female community college students who were interested in IT, and that provided a bridge program between high school and community college. In other cases, we have the female students who, who, are, who may be good to recruit into STEM at the post-secondary level, but don't have the academic or technical skills that prepare them to succeed in the program area. So those recruitment strategies look a little bit different. There are uh, strategies that organizations around the country have, have implemented with great success. These are strategies that cost a little bit more money and take a little bit more time. So it may not be feasible to replicate on site for you. It may be a way for you to advertise for these programs or other programs for students in your, at your community college, tech college, or at the high school if you want to bridge them into those programs. So, for example, there are exploratory workshops. The Madison Area Technical College has a program called Tools for Tomorrow where they bring students in, female students in during the summer, and they um, share with them a variety of different non-traditional program areas that they can test out and work with teachers before making the decision. And then there are skills workshops or training programs. So for example, in New York City, there's a program called NEW. The Chicago Women in the Trades has a program. Vermont Works has a program. And they provide specific skills programs for women who are interested in the trades. So that's a way to bridge a knowledge gap that students, that students might have in STEM is to have specific focused program. Thirdly, I, I, for, as a recruitment strategy, I, all of us can think about changing our conversations. So in 2008, the National Academy for Engineers issued a report called Changing the Conversation, Messages for Improving Public Understanding of Engineering. And the report presents and discusses findings from both qualitative and quantitative research 
which included an online survey of over 3,500 people, both adults and children. And they also wanted to specifically look at race and gender differences as it relates to the perception of STEM and engineering and to what would be attractive based on if, if there was something based on race or gender that would attract more students and more people into the field specifically of engineering but of STEM in general. And the project did a couple of things. It confirmed that most folks have do not have a strong idea of what engineers do on a daily basis and that there's a strong sense that engineering is not for everyone and particularly not for girls. So most messages are framed to emphasize the strong links between engineering, science, and math and needing a high skill set in those areas to be successful in STEM. So when the National Academies for Engineering looked at this data and then started to test what are some other ways to talk about engineering that might broaden its appeal. What they found in particular is that there are four messages that really resonated with younger students and in particular female students. And those messages are that engineers and, and STEM make a world of difference, that STEM requires creative problem solving, that engineers and STEM help shape the future, and that STEM and engineering is essential to our health, happiness, and safety. So as we work with students and think about how to recruit students into our STEM programs and classes, de-emphasizing, while, um, while, while not hiding the skill set that's necessary, but fronting or leading our conversations with these four messages about STEM is a way to change our conversation and increase our ability to recruit students into STEM, particularly female students. The final, uh, the, the next recruitment strategy I want to focus on is target female students. And I know that that's the topic of the presentation, so it's almost assumed, but one of the things that is a challenge for us as educators is that we believe that education is the pathway for all students to contribute to their community and live a satisfying life. So we often work to erase difference when in our classroom and in our office and believe that the door is open for everyone or that there's equal opportunities. And when we do that, one of the things that happens is we mask the reality that people and groups of people have had different opportunities and experiences, particularly as it relates to education. And when we think and reflect on recruiting and retaining female students into STEM, we need to specifically have to uh, think about that history and the cultural stereotypes around STEM and specifically target female students. So while a career fair or a STEM fair may be open to everyone, we and that we expose students to all careers, the reality is that males and females will migrate to different careers because of a, that long history of sex segregation. So it may push us outside of our comfort zone as educators, but we need to think specifically about strategies that are targeted to recruiting and retaining female students into STEM. So that means that the marketing needs to be explicit. It means that um, there may be programs that are specifically targeted to females in STEM. And it may be strategies that I'll share with you as my uh, favorite cheapest strategy is implemented by my friend Ken Bremer here in Madison, Wisconsin. And Ken is a tech ed teacher who approached the counselor who was in charge of scheduling and asked whether she could please include all of the female students who signed up for his class in one in in the same period and she said that that she would be able to do that and he then approached the female soccer team and said in less than five minutes said if you whoever signs up for my class i can guarantee you that you'll be with your friends on the team so in less than, it, it probably realistically took him more like 15 minutes, but in 15 minutes and with no money, he was able to craft a solution 
to recruiting female students that really made a difference in, the, in his classroom um, participation rate. This is an example of uh, marketing that's specifically targeted to middle schoolers regarding STEM and engineering. It's called Engineer Your Life, and they have brief videos. So if you are not able to create your own videos, there are some that are already made and available for you online. And so Engineer Your Life is an excellent resource for videos for women in STEM. And the final recruitment strategy, so this is getting girls into STEM is to capitalize on ability, not interest. And this is one of the research nuggets that really changed how I thought about recruiting female students in particular into STEM. And the counseling re researchers noticed that there was a difference between males and females in terms of career choice or career interest, and that for male students, interest preceded ability. So in other words, if there was something really intriguing or interesting about an innovation or about a tool or a technology, whether or not they thought they would be successful wasn't the issue, but interest led them in their direction to explore that technology or, or that career choice. For female students, the ability precedes interest. In other words, female students were more likely to pursue careers when they knew that they had the foundational skills to be successful in those careers. So when, um, you, when we put energy into hosting fairs to encourage students to take our classes and we lead with um, innovations or inventions or the latest technology, that is certain to work, that is more likely to work for male students to come into the program than it is to female students. So what does that mean? It means a shift in how we recruit so that we target female students who are successful in math, science, and technology as measured by their performance in um, algebra one or geometry or trigonometry and that the recruitment is specifically linked to their success in those programs as a foundational skill that they need to be successful in a further sequence class. So for example, in pro a Project Lead the Way program in Iowa City, Iowa, the shift went to identifying students in math classes that, that were doing well and issuing a personal invitation by saying, we know that you have strong math skills and we know that you can do well in this course, so please come check us out. There are some specific ways to do this. For example, um, there are, you can do kudos cards. You can, put, you can come up with a standard template like they're doing in U46 in Illinois that says, we know that you're doing well in this course. We invite you to look at these, these other courses and expand their horizons. In uh, Western Iowa, what a community college is doing is that they are going into a required IT course for all students and being very clear that because the students are in the required course and doing well, they know they have the skills to go further in the IT programs and trying to pull students into courses that are traditionally underrepresented by female students. So to summarize the recruitment strategies, which is how do we get female students through the door? It is paying attention to those bridges between middle school and high school. It's targeting female students, being, being specific to recruit female students, and capital, capitalizing on ability versus interest for female students. Now we're going to turn to, you have the female students in class, and they don't complete the program. So the retention of female students in science, technology, engineering, and math, and what are the strategies that specifically address retention? Before we dive into those strategies, we need to pause to reflect on why we need to pay attention to gender in STEM as a retention issue. So we have, we all are made up of very complex, diverse social identities. We, it comes from a lot of different places, our race, our sex, our age, our political affiliation, 
medical diagnoses, high schools, colleges, favorite sports teams. And each of those identities comes with a set of expectations or stereotypes, which vary based on, based on context. So for example, being female as a restaurant guest carries little weight or expectation. So I don't pay attention to gender when I order food in a restaurant. In other words, my gender is not salient. On the other hand, gender is always present for my sister when she is working because she's one of the few women who install Met Towers around the country. So Met Towers go up before turbines are sighted and she does it for residential wind turbines to identify where the best location is. So she's one of the few women who install Met Towers, which means that when she interacts with clients, when she's working with other installers, when she's talking to vendors, she has gender always present in her mind because she's often the only female and in many cases representing female Met installers are female and renewables. And this is similar for race. So in education, we're all aware of the achievement or opportunity gaps. But so students and families and educators all know that the gap is stacked against black students or African American students, native students, many Hispanic students, many Asian students, and stacked in favor of white students. So when students of color are present in the classroom, and particularly when there's a racial difference between the educators and students, race is present even when we don't discuss it. So in other words, race carries salience or weight in the context of education. And it carries a different salience or weight in the social setting that is homogenous. So as a Packers, another example is as a Packers fan, I live in Wisconsin, that carries little weight within a school setting because there's not a history or a social norm or cultural expectation that would preference a Packers fan over a Vikings fan. Even in other words, in Wisconsin, Vikings fans can succeed in school and in all areas of school, so that identity does not have salience in an educational context. So what we know is this, and when students, students are particularly vulnerable when one aspect of their identity carries cultural stereotypes within the particular context. This is called stereotype threat, and, for, and this is present for women in STEM. So our strategies really focus on how to inoculate, is the language of the researchers, students against stereotype threat. There are over 300 studies about stereotype threat and the specific strategies to reduce stereotype threat that you can implement in your program or your class. And they're find on, found on reducingstereotypethreat.org. And we're going to go through those specific strategies and talk about the research and what it means for you in your classroom or program. So one of the strategies that has been shown to reduce stereotype threat is to reframe or use different language to describe the task or the test being used. So using words like, this assignment is a reflection of your practice or your work learning the unit, rather than, this assignment will tell me whether you are good at blank or fill in the blank. Um, in 2008, the, one of the research studies showed that simply addressing the fairness of the test um, can alleviate the stereotype threat in te any testing situation. So what they did, what the researchers did was introduced the test by saying this test, although diagnostic of underlying ability, is sex fair and race fair. And um, Daniel Brown is a physics instructor in Dallas who implemented this strategy and was amazed at the results. So I encourage you to think about adding that language before any of your assessments as you um, in your classroom. Another body of research looks at how to de-emphasize the threatened social identities as a strategy. So in other words, how can we de-emphasize gender in your STEM classroom 
so that the female students do not feel as threatened in the classroom. And this is based on six research strategies, and there are three retention strategies. The first is to always list the demographic information at the end of all tests and assignments. So Stricker, uh, there, Dr. Stricker and Ward in 2004 conducted a study for the Educational Testing Service. This, they coordinate the AP test. And they provided evidence that simply moving the standard demographic inquiries about race and gender to the end of the test resulted in significantly higher performance for women taking the AP Calc test. And so, and what they found, there was a later follow-up study that if the ETS would actually move the demographic information to the end, that an additional 4,700 female students would receive advanced placement credit in calculus, so moving, bumping up to an average of three then on the AP Calc test. Another retention strategy based on this idea of de-emphasizing threatened social identities is to encourage individuals to think of themselves in ways that reduce the salience or weight of that identity. So in other words, to think, to be clear in your classroom that people, that the students are bringing a very um, robust and complex set of identities that are important in the classroom. There, were, uh, there was a study in 04 that showed, for example, that, the, that students encouraged to think of themselves in terms of their valued and unique characteristics were less likely to experience stereotype threat in mathematics. So they specifically looked at the female change if they were uh, seen as scientists and mathematicians and scholars and movie lovers and book lovers and hikers and campers and basketball players, in addition to females and uh, students in the classroom, that increased their comfort and ability and persistence in courses. Uh, another way to do this, a slightly different way to do this is that was explored in 2005 after that first study is that they used something called self-concept map. So on the screen, there's, the, there's an image of a self-concept map that was drawn by Yukiko Konishi. And what, it, and what the study did in 2005, they uh, asked students to make a self-concept map that either had a few concepts, so reflect the person most basic or fundamentally important characteristics, or many concepts. So you see on the map here, there are many ways of talking about that, that Yukiko talked about herself. And what they found was that um, compared to individuals who didn't make maps or who only made maps with a few concepts, only women who made complex self-concept maps were unaffected by a stereotype threat involving math. So in other words, uh, making sure that students bring, uh, have ways to express their interests and their personalities is a way to retain students in science, technology, engineering, and math. Another strategy that's a research-based strategy that can be implemented in your classroom or if you're a counselor or advisor through work that you do with students is something is around encouraging self-affirmation. So in 2006, a body of researchers provided evidence that encouraging female college students to self-affirm eliminated the um, performance gap that typically arose in math and particularly spatial ability. So, they were able to, to provide a strategy that inoculated students against math stereotypes, and there are some specific examples like the University of Cincinnati handbook called that, that includes work around setting goals for yourself and motivating yourself to succeed. There are other um, strategies like at the beginning of each unit asking students what they bring to the topic and what um, they know about the topic and why it's important in their lives, and including a reflection question on exams or other assessments that asks students to identify their strengths related to the material or why the material is important to them, their family, and their communities. 
A fourth strategy is to change or expand your qu the quality of feedback to students. So this is from a research study that was done in 1999 and talked about constructive feedback, which communicates both high standards perform for performance, which is something that certainly all educators do, and it couples it with the assurance that students are capable of meeting those standards through practice. So the um, constructive feedback it includes specificity, that, that what we normally think of as constructive feedback, so specificity, high standards, and an additional element that, that the student can certainly get there through practice. The fifth retention strategy I'd like to focus on is providing role models. And um, this is not a strategy that is um, new to any of us. One of the things that was really striking to me, though, as I, as I think, reflect on the research, is that in 2000, there were a couple of studies in 03 and 05. And what they discovered was that Reading essays about successful women in STEM can alleviate performance deficits under stereotype threat. So it, it, it certainly it would be great if we had more female teachers in STEM, if we have more diversity in our STEM faculty based on race and gender and, and ability status. It certainly would be a strength to have role models coming in and co-teaching and uh, mentoring programs. And if those things aren't in place, there are other strategies that are um, cheap, easy, and effective. And what the researchers in a couple of these studies did was tested, what's the magic number? Is it one essay? Is it two essays? Is it three essays? Is it four essays? And they, and they looked at those four options. And what their evidence suggested was that even providing a single essay that was about a successful woman in STEM was enough to increase the persistence of students in that math sequence. So um, can, are there ways that you could add pictures to your syllabus or blackboard of past students or people in your discipline who have succeeded that don't look like you but look like the students in your class? Um, could you add a guest lecturer? If you have an office, can you add images or essays in the waiting room for students to come to look through as they wait for you? The image that's on the webinar is from the PDK poster project series, and it's called the series is called Using Visual Means to Challenge Stereotypes. And they have a really fantastic series of women in mathematics. You can also order posters from Her Own Words, which specifically focuses on um, women in the trade. And then Vermont did the, a really great um, variation of this idea of visual or virtual role models. And they developed a moving exhibit called Labor of Love. And it featured women in the unions in, in labor in Vermont. So that's another way to do that, or another model to do to you to look to. The sixth research-based strategy highlight uh, that's highlighted in the research around stereotype threat is to provide external attributions for difficulty instead of letting students who struggle assume that their struggle is because they're not good at the STEM skills. So an example is to introduce difficult units by saying, these are difficult concepts in our discipline. They'll take time to master and require a lot of practice. If your past, if your past students have struggled with a particular part of the material or curriculum, to flag and make explicit that struggle to your current class so they know that it, they're not alone and it's not based on their ability or inability to perform or understand the concepts, but this is a place where there's a lot of struggle generally, and assure the students that they can master the content. And this is a strategy that's particularly important for women in STEM. And the research around attribution theory shows that for women, um, the success is externally at attributed. So in other words, luck or chance, it was an easy test, um, I slept well, played a role in success versus failure is often internally attributed. So 
I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician. And the failure is taken personally. So it uh, reduces the willingness to try again. And there's both a fear of failure and a fear of success. So the internalization is detrimental to self-confidence. And so when we look at that compared to the attribution trends that are uh, not always seen in male students, but that are generalizable in male students, is the, the reverse. That in fact, success is internally attrib attributed, or in other words, I am smart or good at math. I'm a strong math student or strong scientist, and so successful. And failure or weak performance on an assessment or skill set is, is because it's out of their control. It was a hot room. They're tired or bad luck. I studied the wrong things, um, the, or the teacher grades really hard. So what that means is a retention strategy is to, for teachers to be very explicit about what success means. It means practice on this skill set and understanding of a particular domain of knowledge that leads to success and that it's not that people are born into the world able to do um, physics or able to be engineers. The final strategy that I want to look at today for retention is a strategy that is emphasizing an incremental view of ability, and it is looking at what the research calls a growth mindset. So Professor Carol Dweck is at Stanford and is the foremost researcher regarding growth mindset. She wrote a book entitled uh, Mindset, the New Psych Psychology of Success. And according to Dr. Dweck, we can all be placed on a continuum according to what we, where we think ability comes from. So some of us believe success is based on innate ability, and this is called a fixed mindset. And we can have these, we can have, we can be at different points along the continuum based on different things that we're learning. So for example, you could believe that people have innate skill when it comes to, or ability when it comes to music and sports, but believe that growth mindset is the key for science, technology, engineering, math, reading, other areas. So it, because you have a growth mindset in one domain does not mean you have a growth mindset in all domains. The differences between fixed mindset and growth mindset um, are shown in this table. So individuals with a fixed mindset often believe that intelligence is static. And so because of this, it's important to look smart. And one of the consequences of that is that they often attend, tend to avoid challenges. So, they, so people with a fixed mindset sometimes give up easily when they encounter an obstacle or see effort as fruitless or ignore feedback and can be threatened by other success. And people who have a growth mindset believe that intelligence can be developed and that the, because of this, they want to learn more and tend to embrace challenges and persist when they encounter obstacles. They'll see effort as a path to mastery and learn from their mistakes. One of the reasons this is a critical learning for us as we think about retention it will often lead to students choosing another career path or educational class. And so making explicit the need to have a growth mindset in a STEM discipline is one of, is a very powerful way to work with students, particularly female students, to retain them in STEM. Um, how did you overcome the struggle? Flashcards or groups or tutoring or extra study over the summer and reward student effort rather than um, the, by awarding credit for corrected or improved assignments.
So to sum up the retention strategies, there are strategies around reframing the task, de-emphasizing our threatened social identities, encouraging self-affirmation, providing role models, providing external I want it to open the conversation now up with an invitation from Dr. Geneva Gay, who is a leader in multicultural education, who asks all of us to try one more thing when we think about the work that we're doing around equity. So as it relates to recruiting and retaining female students in non-traditional careers through your classes, I encourage you to try one more strategy that we shared today. And I'm now look, opening this up for questions. We appreciate the conversation that you all were having on the chat. I know that there were some really interesting comments going back and forth. So if anyone has questions, please let me know via the chat. Uh, the question is, do you have resources to teach growth mindset? There's a couple of resources that I would recommend. One of the, um, there is a couple, there are a couple of discussion questions or book club guides around uh, mindset that is the book. I think it's St. Paul, I don't think it's Minneapolis. And they have a book club guide for the actual book mindset. The Dr. Carol Dweck gave a um, webinar on growth mindset. couple more questions. The association's work that is housed at Harvard University is a great resource it for educators and to explore um, implicit or unconscious bias. So the Implicit Association Test or Implicit Association Project is out of Harvard University and has a lot of tremendous online resources. The person who can um, book club guidelines. after our webinar concludes, but we do have an hour scheduled for today, so I want to thank you all for joining us to discuss the research-based strategies to recruit and retain female students into non-trad careers. And again, our thanks go out to the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities for providing the funding for this project. I hope that you can join our virtual community of educators And if you're able to join us at our annual Professional Development Institute in Washington, D.C. in April, we would love to see you there. At the end of this webinar, we're going to um, put up a would like to see through our webinar series and 
if you are wanting a certificate of participation, that will happen via the evaluation as well. So if there are there the question about posting the system website. With that, thank you. Have a great afternoon, and I look forward to seeing you in February.